one man here ain't gonna make any difference, but one man up there could take care of all our women, folk, and kids and get them to a place where they're safe and then come back. Welcome to today's show. My name is John. As always, you can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Also, there are links to social media in the podcast show notes, and you can also go to classicmovierev.com to read notes, bios, and other random movie thoughts. Today's movie is The Man from the Alamo, 1953. This film has a pretty low rating of 6.5 on imdb.com. It fared a little better on RottenTomatoes.com with 100% on the tomato meter based on a few reviews and 70% audience approval, which is about the same as the IMDb rating. The New York Times film critic at the time of release didn't care for it either, saying, quote, Universal International's respectable, old-fashioned outdoor melodrama, The Man from the Alamo, is another medium-budget historical western of strictly medium unhistorical significance. At least beginning right by dispatching their Texan hero, Mr. Ford, from the Alamo siege to his upstate home, where he is promptly ostracized for cowardly desertion. Actually, it's a pleasure to find a Western protagonist as cynical and independent as Mr. Ford, for all his great big heart underneath. However, his grimly sealed lips make the entire picture one of those annoying enterprises that might have evaporated from one spoken sentence. For Mr. Ford is no coward or deserter, you can bet your life, having been delegated by the Alamo Texans to return and safeguard their families. Another cause for wonderment is why the studio persisted in putting the lovely, capable Miss Adams as the hero's one friendly sponsor out to pasture. Chili Wills, Victor George, Hugh O'Brien, and Butch Cavell fill supporting roles competently enough and we still would like to know why the man from the Alamo elected to keep his mouth shut, unquote. Actors. Right, and I'm a Shakespearean actor. Sadly, we lost Julie Adams on February 3rd, 2019 at the age of 92. Miss Adams played Beth Anders, and please consider this my humble tribute to her. Julie Adams was first covered in episode 63, Creature of the Black Lagoon, 1954, where she was the object of the creature's affection. Glenn Ford is very good as the falsely accused deserter John Stroud. Ford was first covered in episode 35, Blackboard Jungle, 1955. Chili Wills played the one-armed grouch, John Gage. Gage had a strong dislike for Stroud. Wills was covered way back in episode 3, McClintock, 1963. Neville Brand was great in the role of anti-independence fighter slash robber named Dawes. Brand was first covered in episode 30, Birdman of Alcatraz, 1962. Stuart Whitman was uncredited as an orderly, but I never saw him. Whitman was covered in episode 16, Night of the Lepus, 1972. Hunko Rama, Hugh O'Brien, played Lieutenant Lamar. Lamar made the entire arc during the movie. O'Brien was born in 1925 in upstate New York. He graduated from Kemper Military School in Missouri. He was a good athlete and began studying law at the University of Cincinnati. In 1942, at the age of 19, he left school and joined the Marine Corps. He was assigned to be a drill instructor. After World War II, O'Brien was discharged in Los Angeles. He planned to study law at Yale in 1947 using the GI Bill. While earning money to buy a car, he ended up working at Swab Sunset Strip Drugstore, a hangout for the acting set. He began dating an actress, and the only way he could see her was to go to her rehearsals. The leading man failed to show up, and O'Brien got the role. A bit part in Never Fear 1950, directed by Ida Lapina, got him noticed and signed to a contract at the age of 25. He was used mostly as a background player in films like Red Ball Express 1952, Son of Alibaba 1952, Seminole 1953, and The Man from the Alamo 1953. He left Universal in 1954 and scored big the next year with the television series The Life and Legend of Wyatt Earp, 1955-61. O'Brien worked until 2000, mostly in television, but with films like Ten Little Indians, 1965, In Harm's Way, 1965, The Shootist, 1976, Game of Death, 1978, 
the one they pieced together after Bruce Lee's death, and Twins, 1988, with Arnold Schwarzenegger and Danny DeVito. O'Brien died in 2015. Victor Jory played Mexican sympathizer and bandit Jess Wade. Jory was born in Canada in 1902. He served in the U.S. Coast Guard during World War II. He was a military wrestling and boxing champion. Following the war, he began working on Broadway. He made his first movie in 1930 and had a career going by 1932. He had a dark and angular look, and he mostly played bad guys. He was in a bunch of westerns. He played Oberon, King of the Fairies, in A Midsummer Night's Dream, 1935. He played the super angry field overseer in Gone with the Wind, 1939. IMDB says he had a sympathetic role in Cat Women of the Moon, 1953, but I haven't seen it. He was back to the bad guys in The Man from the Alamo, 1953. He played an Egyptian chief in Valley of the Kings, 1954. That's the one where you can hit your crew. He was on television's Manhunt, 1959 to 61. In The Miracle Worker, 1962, he played the unhelpful father of Helen Keller. He had a very odd role in A Time for Dying, 1969, as Judge Roy Bean. I recently watched this film because it was hailed as Audie Murphy's best work. It wasn't worth the time to see Audie's few scenes. He played an Amazonian chief in the Escape from Devil's Island film Papillon 1973 with Steve McQueen and Dustin Hoffman. He continued working until 1980 when he retired. He was the original narrated voice of the Cyclorama in Atlanta, Georgia until replaced by James Earl Jones. Visit the Cyclorama if you get a chance. I first went there when there was no narration and a lady with a flashlight told the story from memory. Jory died at the age of 79 in 1982. Story. Let me explain. No, there is too much. Let me sum up. The movie begins with the Texas apology bit, where the nice Anglos are being good Mexican citizens. Then bad old Santa Ana takes over. Poor old Sam Houston was forced to raise an army and fight for independence. It's more likely slavery was illegal in Mexico and the Anglos living there wanted to make Texas a slave state in the U.S. Rich Anglo-Texans are debating fighting Santa Ana for independence. Sam Houston, Howard Negley, comes into the meeting and tells of the battle that is developing in San Antonio at the Alamo Mission. The scene switches to Colonel Travis, Arthur Space, meeting with Jim Bowie, Stuart Randall at the Alamo. Sam is in attendance. They have sent a messenger to Sam Houston asking for help. Rev, Dennis Weaver, comes in to say that a Mexican under a white flag is outside. The soldier gives him the Duguello warning. Surrender or die. No quarters. Travis fires a cannon as a no answer. It starts a night fight. When the flag is knocked over, all the men watch as one man risks his life to rehoist the flag. He is killed. John Stroud, Glenn Ford, runs to the flag and raises it above the mission. That night, Stroud and his neighbors sit around talking. Reb is from Tennessee, and he tries to explain why they are fighting in Texas. I don't understand that anyway. What are you guys from Tennessee doing way down here? Ain't no war in Tennessee. Seems to me you could have found one near home. Yeah, well, we're considering starting one, but David Crockett said you Texans need some help. They have heard that Texans, like Jess Wade, Victor Jory, are getting land grants to work for the Mexicans. We got word that Santa Ana has given out land grants to Texans to fight on his side. Why, you don't think anybody's going to hire out to him, do you? Yeah, know one of them already. Got a lot of followers, too. A fellow named Jess Wade. Lieutenant Lamar, Hugh O'Brien, rides through the Mexican lines with a message from Houston. He speaks to Davy Crockett, Trevor Bardet, first. The men on the wall ask what is going on up north where their families are living. He says they are raiding around Oxbow where the men's families are. Lieutenant Lamar tells him that no help is coming from Sam Houston. The five men from Oxbow plan to send one man back to protect their families. Just five of us here got families up there in Oxbow. Nobody to take care of them. And one of us don't do it, nobody else will. Now, one man here ain't going to make any difference, but one man up there could take care of all our women, folk, and kids and get them to a place where they're safe and then come back. They draw beans and Stroud gets the black bean. Travis calls the men out and lets them know that no help will be coming. He gives him the opportunity to stay or leave. Having drawn the black bean, Stroud is the only man who does not volunteer to stay. 
Travis can't believe such a brave man is leaving, but he provides him with a horse anyway. Travis reads a letter to Houston saying he will stay to the death. Lieutenant Lamar is sent out with the letter. Bowie, Sam, Lieutenant Lamar, and Travis watch Stroud leave. When some men say Stroud is yellow, the others tell him of the drawing of the lots. But no one will ever know. Stroud makes it through the fire and hell of the Mexican line. He rides hard, but every homestead he visits is already burned out. When he makes it to his home, it is destroyed as well. Someone takes a shot at him, but he quickly sees it is Carlos, Mark Cavell, a young Mexican boy that worked on the ranch. He tells Stroud that his wife and son are dead. Carlos says his father was killed as well. Stroud is ready to head back to the Alamo and make the Mexicans pay. Carlos says the men that did this were Jess Wade's guerrillas. I'm going back to the Alamo. Now the Mexicans are going to pay for this. Senor, it was not Mexicans who did this. It was Americans. Now you, you and your father have been with my family a long time, Carlos. My wife and my son and I, we loved you very much. It's no time now to start lying to protect your people. I'm not lying. They have Mexican uniforms, but they are not Mexicans. I hide in the hills and watch. In Franklin, Texas, Sam Houston and Lieutenant Lamar arrive and are greeted by the one-armed John Gage, Chili Wills. They then tell them the Alamo has fallen. He orders all women and children and men over 60 to leave town before Santa Ana's army arrives. Lieutenant Lamar's family is in town. Lamar tells the town that Stroud left the Alamo. Lamar's detachment is left behind to guard the evacuees. Stroud and Carlos arrive in Franklin, and he tries to leave Carlos in the town. Beth Anders, Julie Adams, agrees to take Carlos. Stroud finds out for the first time that the Alamo has fallen. Is there anybody on the wagon train? Maybe I can pay to take care of the boy? You? Yeah, what's wrong with him? Well, he's a Mexican. Or maybe you didn't know we're at war with him. I didn't know we were at war with kids. Why don't you take care of him yourself? That's not fair, Mr. Gage. The gentleman undoubtedly wants to join the army. I'll look after him, Ma. He won't be any trouble, and there'll be no charge. What's your name? Carlos. What are those bells for? For the men in the Alamo. What about the Alamo? It's fallen. Every man in it was killed. Lieutenant Lamar comes and starts giving him grief. John Gage calls all of the folks to see the coward Stroud. Gage gets really rude as Stroud leaves. Some drunken Wade men, including Dawes, Neville Brand, come out of the saloon shooting in the air. The town folks grab them, and Carlos tells that Dawes is one of the men that raided the ranch. Stroud tries to get to Dawes, but Lieutenant Lamar tries to throw him out of town. Stroud punches Lamar and is almost hanged. The sheriff stops the group from hanging Stroud, but he refuses to leave town, so the sheriff arrests him and throws him in the cell with Dawes. Dawes knows that Stroud is the man that left the Alamo. Stroud tells Dawes that he may join the Mexicans. Sort of gave you a rough time, didn't it? They did the same to me. Got an awful lot of law in this town. Seems like. My name's Dawes. What's yours? Stroud. So you're the guy who quit the Alamo, huh? From what I heard, there wasn't much use in staying. Man's a fool to buck a game. The cards are stacked against him. I know a lot of guys who didn't feel that way, but I ain't walking around either. Dawes is suspicious. Dawes also says they will escape soon. The wagon train is set to leave and the town gold is loaded. Some of the soldiers are talking about hanging Stroud and Carlos goes to warn him. Beth comes and takes Carlos to the wagon. After they are gone, Dawes tells Stroud about Jess Wade and he says he can join the gang. Stroud says he is in. The able-bodied men are left behind as the women, many Alamo widows, head out with Lieutenant Lamar's detachment. Beth is kind to Carlos, and he tells her that Stroud left to take care of the families around Oxbow. The men in town have built a barricade in the main street of the town. The talk turns to hanging Stroud. The men storm the jail and drag Stroud outside and put a rope around his neck. At the same time, the Wade gang storms into town. The raid stops the hanging. Dawes and Stroud arm themselves and head out. Stroud thinks for a bit about shooting Dawes. 
Then he knocks one of Wade's men off a horse and joins the fleeing group as they ride back to their camp. Stroud is really cocky with Wade. Wade accepts him because he has guts. Where'd you come from? Town? Why'd you leave? I had a little throat trouble. They were gonna hang him. Why? He quit the Alamo. Is that right? That's right. The Alamo. What were you doing there in the first place? Well, what would you be doing there if the whole Mexican army was out? That wasn't what I asked you. That's the answer you're gonna get. I'll say one thing for you. You got plenty of guts because right now you could be in a lot of trouble. I've been in trouble before. Stroud says he left the Alamo to get a Mexican land grant at the end of the war. That night, Dawes and the other members of the gang ask questions about Crockett and Bowie. When one of the men calls him yellow, Stroud beats the crap out of him. Wade accepts Stroud and is told that they are going after the wagon train because the town's gold is loaded on it. At the wagon train, Lieutenant Lamar decides to go through the gorge to save a day's travel, even though it's an ideal ambush location. Lamar overrules Gage. Wade and his gang ride into ambush position. Stroud is sent to a watch post with another man guarding him. Gage tries to stop Lieutenant Lamar from taking them through the gorge. Lamar is adamant in his jackassery. Stroud can see the wagon train coming. He tells his guard that he wants to protect the wagon train. The guard decides he is going to kill Stroud with a pig sticker. Stroud gets the better and shoots the guard, warning the wagon train to turn back. Lieutenant Lamar sends four men to fight a delaying action while he heads back with the wagons. They circle the wagons. Wade climbs up to kill Stroud. Stroud tells Wade he knows that he murdered his family. They have a gunfight and Stroud rolls down the hill. The soldiers arrive and drive Wade away. The soldiers capture one horse and it has Stroud's gear on it. Carlo speaks for Stroud. That night, Carlo sneaks out to find Stroud. He tells Beth what he is up to. I'm going to find him, Miss Beth. It's impossible, Carlos. Why you get lost out there? He's like my father. I must try and find him. No, you'd never be able to. And even if you did, don't you see? He, he's not a good man, Carlos. He's a very good man. But he broke out of jail and joined the Mexicans. I tried to tell you, Miss Beth. They're not Mexicans. They're Americans disguised as Mexicans. And that's even worse. He tells her again that Wade's gang are not Mexicans. Beth helps him go look for Stroud. Two soldiers follow Carlos to protect him. Bad sneaking. Carlos finds the wounded Stroud clinging to life. The soldiers are touched by Carlos's devotion and they help bring Stroud into camp. The people don't want Beth to help him, but some soldiers and others decide it's the right thing to do. Gage is the hardest against Stroud. Gage doesn't want to help Beth with Stroud until Carlos pulls a gun on him. In the morning, they prepare to leave. Stroud wakes up and is a little bit confused about where he is. Beth says she believes why Stroud left the Alamo. Hey, thanks. For what? I do it for anyone. Yeah, you know, this isn't going to make you very popular with your friends. I don't care what they think. Maybe I do. Then why don't you tell them the truth? Carlos told me you left the Alamo to take care of your family and the families of your friends. Who'd believe it? I do. You're no coward. Lieutenant Lamar places him under arrest for being with Wade's gang. Beth can see that Stroud is no coward. Beth has Stroud tell that he fired the warning shots. He also tells that the wagon train is still under danger from Wade. Lieutenant Lamar moves the wagon train into the open where it will be harder to ambush. Stroud says he would take the wagon train south. He says he wants to kill Wade. Stroud thinks he should have stayed at the Alamo because he didn't help his or anybody else's family. Wade's gang rides ahead to ambush the wagon train at the river crossing. A sergeant, Guy Williams, the dad from the original Lost in Space 1965-68, to rides in and gives Lieutenant Lamar orders to take his detachment to San Jacinto. Lieutenant Lamar doesn't want to go. He also wants to keep the soldiers. The sergeant reminds him that that would be desertion. Orders. To report to San Jacinto at once. Well, what about us? Well, the word is, ma'am, that General Houston's ready for an all-out attack against Santa Ana's army at San Jacinto. Troops can no longer be spared for the protection of a wagon train. As a soldier, ma'am, I can't question the command. Sergeant, 
My previous orders were to see these wagons safely across the Trinidad River. That's what I intend to do. If I could have a fresh horse, sir, I'll start back at once with the men. Soldiers are staying with me. If you want to remain, sir, it'll be on your own conscience. But I don't think you can ask 20 of your men to do the same. And why not? I'm in command here, Sergeant. I'm afraid that'd be called desertion, sir. Stroud reminds Lamar that he is about to do the same thing Stroud did at the Alamo. I'm still here. How would you classify me? As a deserter, Mr. Stroud. Oh. Kind of looks like there's going to be quite a lot of us, doesn't it, Lieutenant? These people need protection. My family needed protection. We'll have to be murdered if we leave here. My family was murdered. I'm not only trying to protect my family, I'm trying to protect others as well. Look, if you'd bothered to ask, you'd have found out that's why I left the Alamo. I was trying to do the same thing. Lamar decides to go and leave his family behind, and Stroud says he will take the wagons through. Lieutenant Lamar comes and shakes Stroud's hand. Stroud asks that ten rifles be left behind. As the troops head away, Stroud puts the wagons in a fighting formation. Wade's scout sees the soldiers leave, and he heads to the ambush site. He tells them that the military left and the wagon train is heading southward. They head out after. Stroud is riding Vedette and sees Wade's gang coming. He has the women and children lay down in the wagons, and they make a run for it. The women rise to the occasion like Dorian women of old. Beth is rocking and rolling when the rains break. Stroud rides down the runaway team and jumps onto the lead horse, saving the wagon. With Wade's gang in hot pursuit, the wagons are driven down a draw. They back the wagons up to the river. They load gear in the front of the wagons for protection, and the non-combatants hide below the bank of the river. When Wade's gang rides in, the women in the wagon train wear them out. They rearm for a second attack. Wade and three men circle around behind. The rest will attack when they hear the shooting. Stroud has Gage get two pistols and they ride out. The one-armed Gage climbs a tree and waits for the attack. The main gang makes another frontal attack and is shot down like dogs. Gage shoots a couple of the back attackers. Stroud shoots the other and heads out after Wade. Stroud overtakes him and they fight in the water. Gage yells that they are heading for the falls. Wade is winning the fight, but Stroud judos him over the falls. <laughs> Gage and Stroud ride back to the wagon train where everything is okay. Stroud tells Carlos to stay with Beth and that he is heading for San Jacinto. Gage gets the wagon train moving and Carlos tells Beth that Stroud will be back for both of them. Everybody all right? Yes, thanks to you, Mr. Stroud. Oh, you haven't got far to go now. Carlos, I'll be back for you just as soon as I can, son. I'm heading for San Jacinto. All right, Mr. Gage, let's get these wagons rolling. You heard what the man said. Right. Let's get these wagons rolling. You'll come back, Miss Beth. I hope so, Carlos. So do I. For both of us. Stroud rides away. World-famous short summary. Every man is the hero of his own story. I hope you enjoyed today's show. I really appreciate you spending the time listening. You can find connections to social media and email on my site at classicmoviereb.com. There are links in the podcast show notes as well. This is an independent show, and there is a lot you can do to help out. First, and most importantly, jump over to Apple Podcasts and give me a review. It really helps the show get found. If you want to comment, help, or recommend a movie, email me. Beware the Moors. <laughs>